greetings on a Monday. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Let's just cut right to it. <laughs> Let's just cut right to it. And this is going to be blunt. Don't kill your grandma with COVID on Thanksgiving. I, I have to say this. This has been on my mind for weeks, especially now. COVID's going up everywhere like crazy. I didn't see it in the ER for like a month. I had one. There's one ER I worked in. We didn't have any cases for a month. It was like high in the summer and then it went down and like it was like oh it's gone for a while we get into this little now it's like not only is it like it's not like going up like this like it's gone way people are gonna go home for thanksgiving and literally what's gonna happen it's indoor dining without masks not at a distance where young people are coming together with old people grandmas are gonna die, they're gonna get knocked off by their own family members. It's totally gonna happen. Like you can see this coming, like a train heading, just it's like choo-choo, and it's gonna go Some Some of these epidemiologists, some of these public health guys have said, some of us are Americans, the only way we're gonna take this serious is if somebody close to us dies. Then we're gonna go, oh my God, COVID was real. Should have done something. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be your family. Don't kill your grandma with COVID this Thanksgiving. Okay, so what can you do? Let's talk practically. Let's kind of talk through this stuff a little bit. This is my take. If you want 100%, they're not gonna get it. There's really two, only two ways to go about it. One is don't get together. And a lot of people, a lot of families aren't getting together for exactly that reason. Aren't bringing together young people and old people with medical conditions. And these young people that are running around, living their lives like there's no pandemic. Great, knock yourself out. Just stay away from all old people if you're going to do that. But really, that's incredibly irresponsible right now. I know we're all suffering and depressed and want to be traveling and living our lives. But people are coming in again and they're getting sick. And it's, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. In mid-December, you're going to see posts all over about grandma's dying of COVID. And people are going to be crying. And it's going to be awful. It's going to be worse than it is now. So to be 100% safe, let's talk about this. Either don't get together or if you are going to get together, what you have to do is everybody that's going there has to do a legitimate, uh, a legitimate take it serious 14-day quarantine where you really aren't going out. God, I don't even, I can't even say if you're going out, you're putting the mask on. Where you just, the the more insane you are about the quarantine and not doing anything, the safer the gathering would be. That's how you could bless a Thanksgiving where everybody that got together was legitimate quarantined. Because you're bringing young people together. You got this one high school, college, young 20s, what, or 30, whatever person who's traveling a lot and running around and not wearing a mask. I mean, do not invite them to the holiday. <laughs> they are eliminated. Don't let them come. Don't do it. That's one set of things. Things that are not 100% but also can help, get a COVID test a couple days before Thanksgiving. Make sure that you're negative. Uh, certainly, if you're going to go out, at a distance, wear a mask. You might even consider an N95. <laughs> it's a little bit better than those surgical masks and just a bandana over your face. Um, if you're going to get together outside, at a distance, wearing masks, but that's just not, let's just be honest, that's just not practical. It's cold everywhere and you have to sit down and eat. There's just too much socialization. It's so difficult. That's so hard. Especially, and then a large group of people I'm telling you guys, this is a bad setup. Oh, we're just, people are going to die. Grannies are going to die and families are going to be so crushed. And the irony, the awful thing about it is people are going to do it. It's the family members that are going to end up killing them. It's terrible. Hello, everyone who has... Hi, Amy. Hello, Nishat. Oh my gosh, Vildi, I haven't seen you in forever. Um, that's my concern. So so you re I really want you to take this serious and think about what's the right thing for your family and you going and all of that. 
and talk with all of them. Some people don't take it serious. That doesn't mean you can't. I don't want you to kill your grandma. How awful would that be if you killed your grandma with COVID? What do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about that? I just want people to be safe. Like that is, for the next two weeks, that is my message. Is don't kill your grandma with COVID. Shit's going up. Take it seriously. That's the message. Um, so from what I'm seeing in the ER, the last kind of October, there really wasn't a lot of COVID. It was kind of boring, but I'm glad some of these small towns I'm in didn't have as many cases. That's great. But now things are going up again. And a lot of these symptoms, I want you to know this, are not like obvious classic COVID. Like because we're testing so much more now and the tests are available and we're able to do it. And here's the other thing. We're getting results back in an hour or two. So now we know, now I see, because sometimes I would run a test, wouldn't come back for a week. I wouldn't know if that person ended up being positive or not. Some of them were obvious and they got admitted to the hospital and you knew, you know, so like the classic flu-like symptoms of COVID, cough, body aches, fever, sometimes headache. You've heard about losing your sense of smell, taste. Some people have abdominal symptoms. <laughs> but, you know, I just, I've, I've had people come in just with like nausea and abdominal pain or vomiting or weakness. I had a guy today that came in and he just felt weak. That's it. That was his main symptom. Meh, a little cough, but it got better. Meh, you know, like, but he just felt weak. So my point is, especially, you know, together with this Thanksgiving message, it's really difficult to know if your symptoms are COVID. Now, there's one other thing that I'm seeing a lot now, and I saw a lot of this kind of in late October, was colds. COVID is not the only virus circulating. There's cold viruses going around. So these people typically have a runny nose, nasal congestion, a little cough, sore throat, but they don't have the fever, body aches, you know, tired, weakness, covid -y stuff. I haven't seen any of those that look like classic colds turn out to be COVID with the test. So you can still have a cold, but it's hard to tell them apart. And, and in a couple months, you know, as we enter December and January, February, we're going to add influenza into the mix. Oh boy, isn't that exciting? <laughs> if you're kind of a geek doctor like I am, there'll be a challenge to separating that out. Thank goodness we have a test to do that. So, uh, you know, the conclusion is, you know, anything, many symptoms could be COVID. You all need to, if you're sick, you're worried, talk to a doctor, your doctor, no harm in calling, being seen when appropriate, getting tested, all of that stuff. But for God's sake, take this shit seriously and do not kill your grandma over Thanksgiving. You guys, it's going to happen. And it's not going to happen right away. So so Thanksgiving is what, the 25th or the 24th? Let's say Granny get, gets, ex people get exposed then. You're going to see, so cases have go are going like this right now. And all these states, including California and Chicago, just went on lockdown, friend of mine there. They're all going to start tightening, right? California just closed, in, uh, uh, San Francisco just closed indoor dining, reduced that, reduction. So they're hoping that instead of, Doing it, this is the other part of the message is take it seriously now so that they don't have to close everything down to lockdown. The more seriously people take it now, the less lockdown-y these politicians are going to be forced to do eventually. So in California and San Francisco, for example, they're not going complete lockdown. They're taking a step back. Less, you know indoor dining, movie theaters, gyms, whatever. I think they cut the number of absolute people that can be in the gym as opposed to closing everything down again. But if it doesn't work, if cases keep going up, they will lock everything down. So now is your chance. Take this serious. And, and if we do, collectively, this is everybody. It's not just you. If we do this collectively, then we can avoid a total lockdown. But, but what do you think? Are we going to do this collectively? You know, are we going to be able to avoid the lockdowns, especially now that Biden and Democrats are in power 
and are uh, more willing to lock things down and follow the public health lead, which I think is probably the right thing to do. Now, I will say, and I'm just going to be blunt with you, <clears throat> my experience with the infectious disease public health people is a lot of times they're germaphobes that are nuts. They're nuts and they want to go too far and they're just like, it's all about no germs, no spreading. It's like as if kind of the germaphobe, sorry for the stereotype, it's as if the germaphobe mom had power at the hospital and was setting policy. Um, so I am like not into that perspective and don't trust. And I just, I, as a doctor, I'm just like, I roll my eyes all day long at all of the stupid rules that these guys set. That said, even that's even my feeling in general, but now that people are dying from this thing, you got, we have to take that serious. We have no choice. The germaphobes are in control and in power. <laughs> like it or not. And I think most of what they will do will be appropriate, but some of it gets extreme. Some of it gets extreme. For all the, you know, to all the American folks that are like, we trust, we don't need a mask mandate. We trust people to do it. They're not doing it. So that trust, that's not a reciprocal trust. That trust is not resulting in doing what we need to get done. Didn't work. Didn't work. I think some people feel like, you know, the government doing more is uh, inappropriate, not where we are. Well, I think it's too, it's too far. We're too far, too far into this thing. Do you see that 194? I feel like the other day, new daily COVID cases in the country, total in the country in one day was like, oh, it was like 120,000 and it's going up to like 140. And like, I don't even know what that means. 194,000. Rocket ship. Rocket ship. So in the news, you're going to see all of this drama again and hot doctors are going to be like, oh, hospitals are overflowing and it's going to be awful. It will be awful again. It will absolutely be awful again. So, of course, in the middle of that, with the holidays coming, painful holiday season, I'm like, where can I go to the front lines and just, like, throw myself at this disaster that's on the way? Because it's coming. The disaster is coming. For sure. For sure. You're going to see it in the media and all this stuff. Somehow, you have to take care of yourself not go crazy, not be too depressed, and all that stuff and get through it. Now, that's all the doom and gloom. These vaccines. Two vaccines are greater than 90% effective, which is incredible because, the you know, you take the flu shot, it's like 40 to 60% effective. That's terrible. 90% is incredible. Meaning, they inject you with whatever the vaccine is, and they're able to measure antibody responses, meaning the immune system has created an antibody to the thing that they injected in over 90% of people. That's awesome. <laughs> That's like hope. That's why the stock market is going up because it's like, oh, there will be an end and there will be an end, but it won't be tomorrow in this month. And, and before there's an end, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that's this winter. The winter is going to be rough. Buckle your seatbelts. Plan on, uh, in your mind, I think in most places, you're going to have increased quarantine stuff. And in the, in the places that aren't, you should be, you should be very uncomfortable <laughs> of getting COVID and people dying. <laughs> I don't even know how to say it anymore. You know, like I'm, I'm like trying to make a meme for Instagram that says, don't kill granny at Thanksgiving this year, which is offensive but it's so true that's what needs to be said how do i talk to you people and i don't mean you because i think you probably do your part it's like how do i get to the yahoos how do i get to the dumbasses oh because they're out there there's a lot of them and you know it too let's just finally call it what it is the worst group project fail ever. We have failed, I think. I am Disco Boy. Hello, Disco Boy. You want to do a dance for us? 
Uh, that is insane. It is insane. Pascal, winter is coming. Winter's here, baby, and it's gonna get worse. But you're right. It's coming, it's gonna be even worse. The view is great, where is that? This is Berkeley, California. That is the San Francisco Bay behind us. San Francisco is through the trees. Oakland is that way. Um, it's a nice sunny day. So what do you guys think about that? What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? You have your coffee, I have my coffee. Are you, what are you guys doing for, um, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? How do you feel about Thanksgiving for yourself, for your own health, for your families? What do you think about it? We just haven't had good messaging. People are tired. The public health messaging has definitely been a challenge. What I've observed, I'm like a tiny part of the media, right? Not a big, but the main messaging, people can like hear, it's like they can hear one thing about it. And if it changes, they blip the shit out. Like in the beginning, it was like, don't buy up all the masks because doctors and nurses need them. And that principle is still true, which is don't buy medical equipment if it's going to deprive the people on the front lines that need it. That's still true. But then later the message was, well, they've actually got all the stuff they need. And so a mask does help protect you and, and reduce spread of the disease. So we do want you to wear a mask. Those two messages, people are still today pissed that, that, that there was even two messages about that. And so messaging is, I've just observed, I'm like, wow, that's a really challenging public health message to make with a virus that we're continually learning about. Things are gonna change. The constant message now that I think you just continue to write out is social distance and masks and, and buckle up because it ain't over. Don't do dumb shit. Do your part. I think that's the message. And take care of yourself in the process. Be honest about what you need and deal with all that mental health stuff. Last night I had a, I had a guest fake cough obnoxiously because I made him wear a mask at work. Yeah, not everybody, you know, we can talk about that for a second. You know, there is cost to doing the right thing. It's not always easy to do what you know is right. This is true and this is like a, a true thing in life everywhere. And and now in the pandemic, there are folks who, everybody's got their own perspective, different perspectives, people are gonna act differently. Um, it doesn't change, you know, you doing your part, you doing what you think is right and appropriate for you. And I'm not saying everybody should be on home quarantine for six months and never go out and never do anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to take it serious and you need to think about all of these things that you do, including exposing, potentially exposing people in your family that are at risk. I'm not saying you never go, I'm not saying if you're in a part of the country where there's not a lot of COVID and your gyms are open, and there's one other person in the gym that you don't go to the gym. That's not irresponsible. But what I would be saying is, you don't rush the field at the Notre Dame Clemson game. You don't go to a big party in Tulum, Mexico, where everybody's dancing and frolicking, and then bring that home on a plane to your community. Those things in a pandemic are irresponsible. They are, you know it. Love your content and energy. Disco boy, what's the disco boy about? I need to know. Very small Thanksgiving with just my parents, sister, and I. How do you feel about that? How old are your parents? What are their medical conditions? How are you and your sister? You know, is everybody comfortable with that? Is that low risk? Are you doing the appropriate things to reduce that risk to exposing them? Have you been spending time with them? That kind of stuff. I'm not saying you don't get together. I'm just saying you take it serious and you guys make an informed, smart decision. And then beforehand, maybe if you are gonna do that, especially a week, 10 days before, maybe you don't go out as much. Maybe you really double down on the mask and hand washing, make sure you're doing a really good job with all that stuff. 
it got politicized that screwed everything up politics oh oh man it's it's really really frustrating i think about fauci right he's been in his position for decades and he has served both republican and democrat um presidents and I think the guy's done a great job with his messaging and not getting into that drama and conflict because he could have, right? He could have thrown Trump under the bus and, and really biting his tongue and trying to do his thing. But scientists and public health officials, Osterholm says you got to call balls and strikes. You got to state the facts. You know, we're not doing the kind of things from a federal response uh, that other countries have done that are effective. Whatever the, the thing is, um, they still have a responsibility to speak that truth. And each side, Republican and Democrat, want to blame the other side. Trump didn't do this. Oh, Biden made this a big deal. And the truth is, it's both, right? Trump didn't do it. And Democrats seized on an opportunity to uh, capitalize with people spinning it where people would have died anyway, right? Even if Trump did everything. It's kind of a lose-lose. It's just bad timing of the pandemic for him. And he didn't do the right things. He didn't do the right things. That's also true. Um, but American politics is so, you know, the, the path to victory is to divide and conquer, is to take the issue and to try to split it and, and both appeal to the base and then also spin the story that uh, gets you the votes. And uh, that part of politics is disheartening and, and deflating. And th this should have been an issue where both of these clowns, both of these clown parties, because they're both clown parties. They are. In case you didn't know, I'm independent. And I want to blow up both of the parties. Um, I'm nonviolent. That was a metaphor. Um... This should have been an issue so clearly where we come together with a very clear purpose and that purpose is to, number one, minimize deaths from COVID. And then number two, maintain and safely reopen the economy as safe as possible. That's it. That is it. And everybody, Republican and Democrat, should have been aligned on that common goal and having a conversation about how do we do that? Because there's a lot of weighing things. Complete shutdown the whole time, that's not necessary. That's not right. But doing more things so that when we reopen, we don't have to close back down. That's in the best interest of the economy. So I agree. The, the way that this was handled politically on both sides um, has only hurt the American people. And that's the result of a two-party system in the United States. I'm sorry, but it is. And Trump didn't do a good job. <laughs> you guys, he didn't do a good job. And neither did Pelosi. <laughs> now you got Democrats. You got Pelosi doing her hair, right? Making rules and then doing her hair. They don't apply to me. Then you got Newsom. Guys, you got to take this serious. Can't do whatever. He goes to a 12-person dinner party. It's like, buddy, come on. The truth is they're all hypocrites. They are. To an extent, it's true that we're about our convenience. Yeah. Two-party system is terrible. I just want more from parties, from politics. Hey, Laura Heckman. Hi, Nicole. What up, Randy Manning? Tomas Loftus. Do you have a, do you have a mustache, Loftus? Because it's Movember. I wanted to talk about men's health this month. Where are my mustache, my handlebars? But I didn't get around to it because of politics and COVID. What is the number one cause of death? I had this conversation the other day. We'll talk about women first. What's the number one cause of death in women in the United States? Number one. Who's got it? Number one cause of death in women in the United States. Anybody? Come on, you guys. I know you know this. 
Luke Loftus, if you're watching. Amy Stellar, heart disease. Partial correct. Partial correct. Heart disease. You could lump it together. Heart disease and... In the shot, there's still time. Number one cause of death for women. It actually happens to be the number one cause of death for men as well. When I think of the number one cause of death for women, I think, oh, breast cancer. It's not. It's one of the more common cancers. It's not even the most common cause of death. I think it's number three, cancer cause of death. I think number one, one and two is colon and and uh, lung with women, a lot of smokers. I think breast is three, but it's cardiovascular disease. So heart disease is right. Heart disease includes heart attacks, heart failure includes both of those. But then when you say cardiovascular, you include stroke. And that's where that is number one. And the reason you include them all together is because of the risk factors for that. What are the seven risk factors for cardiovascular disease that are modifiable, that are things we can do something about? So you can't do anything about your family history, mom and dad. You can't do your genes. You can't do anything about your genes. They're yours. You can't do anything about uh, your gender. So being male is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Congratulations, ladies. You have estrogen and lack of testosterone relatively is protective. Uh, but there's seven. Well, you were close. It's they're They're similar. Heart disease is not incorrect. It's just incomplete. Um, so there's seven modifiable risk factors for heart disease. This is important for everybody, men and women, because it's the number one cause of death. What are those seven? J. Valerie, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, physical, act physical activity. That's correct. Those are four. Smoking, blood pressure, diabetes, physical activity, cholesterol, weight. That's true. You're leaving out one more. Excellent. Six of the seven. Crystal, weight. That is absolutely correct. That's one of them. I think of them like kind of the three medical things, high blood pressure, high blood pressure number one, high blood pressure, diabetes, which is your blood sugar, and, and high cholesterol, those three things. And then we have the lifestyle stuff, which includes weight, smoking and drug use, mainly smoking, uh, exercise, physical activity, and then what is the other one? What is the other big modifiable risk factor for heart disease? This is a big one for, for cardiovascular disease. It's a big one, guys. Come on. You know what it is. No, not alcohol. It's similar, though. You put it in your mouth. It affects your weight. Crystal. Cousin, you got it. Food. Diet. Stress matters. You know, there's other things I think I would, if we expanded it, and you talked about stress uh, and things like social engagement and loneliness, I think stuff like that actually probably should be included in that because you can do something about it and i do think it matters but cousin crystal you hit it diet so those seven things if you did well on those seven things meaning got blood pressure cholesterol diabetes under control had a healthy weight exercised regularly meaning like 30 minutes five times a week at least and ate a decent diet where you're not gaining weight and you're eating a bunch of vegetables and not eating garbage all the time and you don't smoke and do drugs, that, listen to this, this is incredible. That would reduce your risk of having a heart attack and a stroke by over 90%. 90%, those seven things. It's like 96 or 94, I forget what it is. So there's a little bit left you know, for other stuff, but 90 something percent if you did all of those. I would argue that stress affects those other factors. Well, absolutely, stress affects and makes everything worse. You could say that stress underlies all that stuff, but you can also eliminate stress and all of those, those are independent risk factors. So. Even when you sort out all these other things, these things, so if you want to reduce your, so, okay, we talk about things you're targeting. Bye, Jay. See you later. Janet. 
See you later. Um, if you're targeting things to do something about, sure, keep an eye on your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, and then do what you can to cope better with stress and then look back at your blood pressure. Now, the, the problem is it's very difficult to intervene on the level of your stress, right? So if you got to kind of yogi level meditation, yeah, your blood pressure can go down. But if your blood pressure is 180 over 120, meditation is not going to bring that to 120 over 80. It's not enough. You need meds. Weight loss would be a big deal. Stress matters. I, I would agree with that. Um, but these seven. Focus on them. Yeah, mental health matters, of course. Look, I look at this stuff like two ways. So on the one health, it's true. Stress, mental health, people... Nobody wants to live their whole life and feel like shit the whole time. And so it's worthwhile to invest in your mental health to feel better now. And there's benefits to your body in terms of these things that we know lead to and cause uh, heart, you know, cardiovascular, heart disease, strokes, and all that stuff. That's true. But I would not look at it and be like, the only thing I'm going to do is focus on my stress I'm not gonna take pills and do anything else to control my cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes. It's not gonna work, it's not enough. For most people, I think most people probably need pills and whatever. Now, I'll just tell you some funny stories. That's most people. If somebody is like incredibly motivated and like ready to lose 100 pounds and eat super clean, plant-based, and do like CrossFit high energy for an hour twice a day, yeah, that's going to do it. They're going to feel, and then meditate for an hour twice. You know, I mean, like, sure. Those kind of folks probably can do a lot of it with lifestyle. But who has that kind of time? You know, like a monk, some CrossFit, uh, veg, CrossFit, you know, vegan meditative monk in the Himalayas? Well, sure. But those are my average patients. Exactly. Who's got that much time? I'll say this stuff. <clears throat> I remember when I was a resident and I had my own patients. This is like 10, over 10 years ago. And I came in, I would come into the room and I, this is very, this is it's kind of so naive. I would come into the room and I would be like, I'm the doctor and I'm going to prescribe weight loss for you. You should need to diet and exercise. And that's it. I didn't tell them how. We didn't like work through it. I even, I, maybe I sent someone to a dietitian or something. And they would come back like a month or two later, five pounds heavier. And I was like, I'm the doctor. I told you to lose weight. A, easier said than done. B, people, most people don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like they don't want to exercise and eat more. And like, it's like, give me a pill. I've learned in time to start with what is important to you, the patient, and what people want, and then from there, explore possibilities, and you know, um, most people don't wanna put in the work and make the change, lifestyle-wise, to um, get all these benefits. That's why we're kinda in, the first, in this spot in the first place. There's all kinds of things to be explored in there, too. Um, and so, the point is, uh, and some people don't want to take pills. Uh, but the point is, you got to get this stuff under control. Medication is an option. Uh, so is lifestyle, but it's harder. It's absolutely harder. It takes more time. It ca Change causes some stress. In the long run, it's better, but in the short term, it causes stress and it's difficult. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just being practical. Uh, there's a place for medication in being healthy. That's what I think. Hi, Tanya. As in your body can cope with it better when you're younger, but then after years of neglect, it catches up with you in older age. That is so true. So true. We try to get away with shit that we can get away with when we're 16. And then when you turn 40, 50, and 60, you don't get away with it anymore. The, the weight doesn't come off. The hangovers last longer. Yeah, for sure. Justin 
M. O'Rourke. What's happening? Smash Quake. So let me ask you guys, when you've had medical stuff, do you prefer to do it naturally, to try lifestyle, to do medication? What do you think, what works for you? Younger people I think typically can do more kind of lifestyle changes and try other things. I think older folks, especially that have more severe high blood pressure, diabetes or cholesterol, for example, need medication. But what do you guys, What have you guys done and what works for you? If, that, if it was that easy, we'd be all models. That's why people don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want reminders. They're screwing up their own lives. You know, that's true. A lot of folks uh, don't like to have these conversations. And so one of the things that I always ask as a doctor is try to be open, you know, try to be open about stuff. So I would say, I would say... No one wakes up and says, how do I reduce my lifespan? It's not intentional. I would never say it's intentional. It's the result of habits, you know, um, which is a con as human beings is a very complex interaction of factors and experience and life traumas and, and, but ultimately, but you know, on the superficial level, it's your habits, your habits determine you know, your health outcomes, mainly diet, exercise, sleep, stress, these kind of things. But as you get, it's the iceberg theory, right? On the surface, surface of the iceberg is what you look like. It's your body, maybe your body, your body composition and all that stuff. And what is that determined by? As you go deeper, you go beneath the surface into the iceberg. On the first layer, it's determined by your behavior, your habits, what you do every day. That is in turn, that is in turn determined by, I would say the first level would be beliefs. What do you believe about food and exercise? And then as you get deeper, deeper level of beliefs is what do you believe about yourself, your identity? And then the kind of the deepest level, I think, is uh, the level of mission and purpose and like the biggest things you believe about the world. And so, and the reason I bring this up is a lot of times people just try to work and, and the lower you go, the kind of the deeper you go into your beliefs and experiences, beliefs about food, about yourself, about kind of mission and purpose, you know, you get your life experiences, some which are very impactful and influential and then many which are traumatic and limiting. And they, they create, especially when they're repetitive, repetitive traumas, they create limiting beliefs about yourself. I am fat. See, that's the level of the identity. It's incredible, right? I am fat. Uh, that's a, if, that, if that's truly what you believe, not that it's temporary, that right now, you know, I have this weight or this whatever, but it's not part of who I am permanently. You know, if that's in your head that way, you can see how just changing your behavior, if that's the deeper belief, this thing is going to trumpet or dominate. And so I've always thought that in addition to working with habits and behaviors, which again are the kind of the la the intermediate the immediate determining factor, you need to work on deeper stuff, including stress. But really it's a matter of, of working with traumas and, and the the deepest held beliefs about yourself and who you are and what you've been through and all this stuff. It's therapy. Some people can just like, Oh, I changed my diet. It was fine. And they lost weight. Some people can do that. But most of the time, those people don't end up heavy in the first place. For those folks who have kind of chronic problems with it, I always like exploring some of this other stuff. And, and let me say, I also believe at the same time that your body works perfectly to, to be designed to do what it was to do, which is survive. We're not designed, and tell me what you think about this, we're not designed to be happy. We're designed really for two things, survival and reproduction. That's it. And so whenever we come upon, upon good food, our bodies are built to devour all of it. So actually, if you end up heavy, you're doing what you're made to do, which is survive, which is pack on energy. Because we were born to be 32 years old and live in, 
you know, situations where we didn't have food, where we starved for a while, you know, nomads wandering the plains and searching for food. I've, I heard that our niche in the, the food web was we were, we would pick out bone marrow with our hands because we could make tools. That's the kind of monkey we were. And so anyway, we're built for survival, not happiness. We're not built for, you know, model, low body fat, bodybuilder physiques, which is why that is such an accomplishment. And I respect that, but it should be the standard. Standard would be be who you are and accept that and get over the rest of that shit, right? Nobody's going to be, you can feel bad about yourself in all kinds of ways, right? I will never have as much money as Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. Maybe that's a limiting belief, but $100 billion, I don't think that's going to happen in this lifetime. It doesn't mean I feel any worse about myself. I'm not going to have low, I'm not going to have 3% body fat. I don't want that. I could probably lose a couple pounds. But anyway, um, habits can be coping mechanisms for stress and survival. Exactly. So, and that's exactly what they are, is moment to moment coping mechanisms for a stress response that's exaggerated. Right, we get stressed out. Adrenaline flows in the same way as if we're being attacked by a bear and we need to run away. But the things that trigger that today are so exaggerated and, and really disconnected from that and misplaced. Um, oh my God, I have another patient to see in the ER. And then like the stress response of bear is coming to attack you comes out for my survival. That doesn't help me cope in a busy ER very well. Well, it gives me a little bit of energy and it responds to whatever. But in the long term, it just makes me kind of a crotchety old doctor. So I got to learn to work with that, right? You talked about that mom of five who was stressed a few weeks ago. She's not eating well and exercising daily. She's surviving and keeping her family intact. We have to think about the whole person. For that mom of five, you know, what is... I, I do think about her. Holy shit. Uh, I can't imagine... Personally, if I had five kids like that and two jobs, two jobs, she had two jobs, two jobs. And she had come in because her kid was screaming in pain because he had this horrible stomach ache because he overate McDonald's. He pounded, a, he snuck a couple extra chicken nuggets and fries. And this poor little guy was like, he was like six and 120 pounds. He was huge, you know, and, and it, you don't have to go very far for like, She's at a survival level. Those kids are alive, done. That's her job. But unfortunately, children, all of us, human beings, her, we have more needs than just to survive, you know, emotional needs and so forth. Uh, in that setting, there's no way for her kid, child to not be neglected in some way and result in overeating probably to calm his feelings of shit that he's not getting met emotionally at home because mom's just able to keep it together to survive. You know, and so, and this is like generational, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you break that? It's a great, it's a great question, but I would never judge her, but that's the reality of that situation. And uh, she's a very nice person. And like I said, I couldn't put myself in that, but um, so like for her, for me to pull her aside and say, you should probably eat more vegetables and be on the treadmill 30 minutes a day. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine saying that to that person like how just like she's just like I'm trying to keep my kids alive and give them some attention while not getting fired at work because if I get fired then I really don't know what we're going to do and this mom is working right she could easily be on welfare and just like writing that but she's working I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for her you need a support system. If people call you fat all the time, that becomes your trauma. You end up believing that. Yeah, positivity matters. If people call you fat, that becomes your trauma and you end up believing that. That's true. There's certainly fat shaming and it's not, it's not easy to be big. It's hard, I think, to... And I think this goes for any of us with any kind of issue... If you truly talk about identity, you know, self perception, self identity, what does that mean? What you believe about yourself to be true. 
and how challenging it is. This goes for all of us to think about any one thing that you believe about yourself at a deep level that you believe you really are. You could take, you can take, if you want to take body stuff, you could take fat. You could also take, uh, the opposite. So somebody could believe, oh, I'm just, I'm naturally skinny. Okay. If that's really a determining foundational belief, then it may get them into trouble because they're like, oh, I am skinny. I can eat whatever I want and I'm still going to be skinny. In time, as we get older and our metabolisms change and we get more stress with work and typically people get married and have kids and have less time to work out, that belief of I am skinny is going to lead them to have habits that result in them being more overweight interesting right and so how do you play with that identity how do you change that really deeply held belief especially if it's something that's been repetitive that's the challenge and here's the process the process is number one you have to question it well is that 100 percent true could it be possible that it's that actually my weight is this but i also could be a pound lighter or 10 pounds lighter. Yeah, that's possible. Well, maybe I'm not fat. Or for the one that believes they're skinny, well, could it be that the truth really is that, yeah, I was thin in my younger years because I was young, had a fast metabolism, exercised a lot and didn't overeat. And now I'm stressed and don't exercise as much and, and don't, and now I'm my metabolism and you know could it be differently so you start to kind of create that questioning the belief at the same time you replace it with a more empowering belief whatever whichever one that is so I think for the skinny person the I am skinny person they say you know my weight is the result of my habits I won't be skinny or thin or whatever forever if I do X Y and Z if I do X, Y, and Z, then I'll be in good shape. Or maybe they change it, change the belief and be like, this is, and then you also put values in there too. What's important to me is to be healthy, to be doing these whatevers. So, so you play with it that way. So, so that's kind of how you start to play with the belief. But what the real thing you do, and this is the breakthrough thing is you have to have these disproving experiences. So if the belief is, oh, I could never be 10 pounds lighter or skinny or, or whatever it is about anything. As you approach, as you kind of start to do the behaviors and tell yourself you can do it and work with those beliefs, but as you start to have these deconfirming, disproving experiences where you start to little by little get in better shape, then your identity and that belief changes. And the key is to have the experience is to see it and to feel it and believe it. And so it's like, that's what I say, see it, then seeing is, seeing is believing. But really experiencing, you see it first, you do it, but when you experience it, then you believe it. So it's having the experience that ultimately, oh wow, I am heavy now. I'm not skinny like I used to be. That's not true. It's like a common thing where we, you know, as you grow older, you, that isn't part of your identity anymore. And you take on a new belief and then the other way works as you know, you see this on the biggest loser, which is not a healthy way to do it, but people become new people. This is that transformation. And, and, and so the key is, is it possible that some other belief is possible? positive self-talk, but then actually doing the things and then experiencing, that's what changes it. Nicole, what's a good thing? What's considered beauty has changed in the middle ages. Weight was considered beauty because it was considered prosperity. Yeah. So it's interesting. If you look at the blue bloods and, and kind of middle medieval, um, beauty, not only was a more voluptuous, you want to take female beauty, for example, more voluptuous woman was considered to have and in a lot of places, even now in the world, in the third world, someone who is more overweight, it, it's a sign of resources where they're not starving and poor, but they have money enough to eat. Um, similarly, having, re, you know, having weight on your bones was not only 
uh, a sign of resources, but then that was also uh, a more fertile, naturally woman who was able to have enough meat on her bones to go through pregnancy, you know? Um, and then also you do want to take skin, much more fair skin. You want to talk about kind of European white, the more fair skin was considered beautiful because they, and desirable because they were not in the sun toiling, getting their skin burned like the labor, the low kind of labor class. The skin thing changed in the 1900s. Do you know this story? This is incredible. The skin thing changed where now, when we talk about a certain kind of white American desirable beauty, like when I grew up, it was like everyone wants to be tan. You want to be tan. Oh, nice tan. You look good tan. I've got like British Irish skin with freckles. Like I never really got very tan. I just, that was never, I was not a tan kid. Everybody wants to be tan. I don't know what it was like in black communities dealing with us white people who wanted to be tan. So bizarre. <laughs> but that came from, so the, the, the ideal of kind of blue blood out of the sun fair pale skin being beauty turning to tan was literally a marketing campaign by Coco Chanel who had developed skin bronzer and wanted to sell the image that the the beach tanned body in California and the beaches was beautiful and they pushed that and look at this we inherited that corporate manufactured idea of beauty in order to sell a product. It's still part of our culture. That's true. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that insane? Alexandra Green is in the house. What would help her would be meal deliveries and a housekeeper so she could spend time with her kids. That's true. Shit, what would help her would be money. Hi, Erica. Hey, Monica. Family... So much of our self-perception identity is formed by your family and the messages why it's important not shame kids in front of them. Oh my gosh, so true. Hi, Jordan. Self-esteem plays a big part. Message from those you're easily internalized. The lens through it takes deep self-work. It does take a lot of work to get through that, but there's hope. Dr. Jason Littleton is chiming in. How are you doing, doctor? Do you want to personally find it harder to stay fit as you're getting older? Do I want personally or do I find it harder to stay fit? Of course. Um, metabolisms change. Um, demands of life between work and kids make it harder. But on the other hand, I get smarter. I know what works and how to do it. Um, I also, it's not, my work life now is not as bad as residency. I have more time to do it. So there's pros and cons. There are some things that are that do make it easier, and there are some things that make it more challenging. That's true. How about you? Do you find that it's harder to be healthy now, or do you think that you're... Do How about this question? Do you feel that the thing, that you live a healthier lifestyle now, that you're a little bit older, and why? Is it harder now? Are you in better health and shape now? Like, there's ways now that I'm definitely healthier I eat more vegetables, for example. My diet is better than it was 10 years ago. Um, I'm not at my peak conditioning exercise-wise for a lot of reasons, but and uh, some of it's COVID and gyms. Um, but in general, I exercise, you know, that part is better. Stress is better. Sleep is better. So there's a lot of things that, I, that are better. But then there are other things that are worse. Like I work a lot of night shifts. It's terrible. It's the worst thing for my health. I don't do crack or smoke or anything like serious bad stuff, but I think the sleep is probably the worst for me. So there you go. Question for you. Are you healthier now than you were five or 10 years ago? Pros and cons. Why? Why or why not? What are you doing for Thanksgiving? I don't want to talk about that yet. I want to ask, I will get to that in a second. I want to ask you these questions like, are you healthier now? than you were five or 10 years ago and why? Come on, people. I've been talking a lot. Your turn to talk. 
Are you healthier now? Why or why not? Hi, Vanessa. Vanessa Chante. Jovan, what's happening? Let me see if I can tap this thing. Oh, now I know who's watching. Sherry, are you watching and not saying anything? Are you healthier now than you were five or 10 years ago? I bet you are. I see you walk, working out all the time. What do you think? Tanya. Yes, I think I'm pretty fit for my age, but I can't splurge and have cakes like I used to as it sticks to you. Yeah, that's true. Like metabolism slows. You can't splurge like you did. And you like cake? Is that kind of your, what kind of cake are we talking? I love cake too. The love handles are fat on me. Eh. I'm healthier now as I'm eating more greens. That's kind of the story with me too. Yep. Love those love handles, baby. I think with regard, as you say that, like, you know, you don't have to, I would say a couple things. That emo, I, I would say like the ideal, and I, who does this? It's really hard. The ideal is to genuinely accept and, and love and not feel bad about your body. Just be like, you know what? I'm alive. I got this body. I'm gonna love this thing. It's another thing to say, you know, I want to be trimmer. I want to lose a couple pounds. That's a goal. That's good. But be careful with the emotion of shame and feeling bad. And once you kind of like withhold self-love and say, well, which is what a lot of us, I think, ultimately are doing with statements like that is like in there somewhere is this belief, which is I'm not lovable unless I am in perfect shape, which means most of us are people with that belief, which, are very, which is very common, are going to go through most, much of their lives not loving themselves. I think a healthier thing is to really work on, can you actually love your body, which I know sounds crazy because none of us are in perfect shape. Can you genuinely love your body, feel comfortable with it, have a positive regard and relationship to it, and at the same time, want and have goals for it to be healthier and trimmer and slimmer and look better yes so it's a both and you can both want to look sexier and, and naked and love your body the way it is now and accept it and feel good about it and just be careful about the the negative stuff and the shame and the feeling shitty because you're not in perfect shape again because who wants to live their whole life feeling bad because they don't have a perfect body like that in the long run that kind of motivation keeps us from our goals more uh, this is ironic if your goal is to look sexier naked you're gonna get there and hold it there better in the long run if you love your body the way it is right now does that make sense And I'm working out more. Good for you, Monica. Both of those are excellent. Tiramisu cake, young. It's the wrinkles that bother me more. I love wrinkles, personally. I like them better than Botox. That's just me. I think we should have... I think that should... We should have a... a I think that part should change. Bingo. Especially if you live in La La Land. Oh, my gosh. LA makes it even harder. Lots of beautiful people. Lots of plastic parts. Not easy to really love and accept that body. But, look... Are we going to change that culture? Nope. That big part is probably with us. So we got to figure out a way to love ourselves in the middle of a culture that really doesn't see it that way. It's very conditional, very conditional love. You're lovable if you're X, Y, and Z. If you're the right color and the right size and the perfect this and the that and the whatever and the... Yeah, but it, but Nisha, the the society tells you all kinds of stuff. You believe everything society tells you? I mean, there's messages for women. A lot of it's about beauty and success. I don't know how you women make sense of all these messages today, right? What does it mean to be a woman today? Well, you gotta be the CEO of a company and you gotta be married to a beautiful arm candy man and have six children and running the PTO. It's just like, 
you know, women's lib, a good thing in general, has just like added more things to the plate. It's like women got to do it all to be perfect. And if you just want to have kids to stay at home, you're not a real woman. And if you, you're not a mother, you're not a real woman. And you know, all these messages, mixed messages. It's a crazy, you can't listen to society. You have to make, you, all, you, all you do in this life is you listen to this. That's how you make sense to all of that. I think you ought to have options. I believe in a society where you can do either and all of that. But that's not the, the message, I don't think. Similarly for men, right? What's the message for men? If you're, you're not success, first of all, the message is it's not to be happy or authentic. It's to be successful, which means rich and powerful, which looks like driving a Maserati with a big breasted blonde woman at your side uh, in a high powered job of significance where you're a workaholic and a baller and a player and all this so that kind of and you're of course a bodybuilder shape and if you're not that you're not successful you're not happy you shouldn't be happy you're not whatever and it isn't it obvious like i keep winking maybe i need to move the camera the sun's killing me let's move the camera a little bit let's take a different there we go that's a little better it's obvious to me that if you accept all of that and you try to live by those kind of rules, the, what the hell? Here we go. If you accept that and you try to live by all those rules, you're never going to be happy. Nobody's going to be happy, men or women or anybody. Edwin, how are you doing, my man? Yeah, the kind of perfection... No plastic, no Botox, no drugs. Body stops dropping. Well, let it hand. I want to make y'all laugh. I. That's true. Life. Look, and another part is, we we overvalue youth and beauty. They're they are great. They're both great. And like, you know, there's a vigor to youth, and um, men and women both increase suicide when you get older. There's consequences of this. Other societies value age and wisdom more. Respect the elderly. There's a place for them. They've been through it. God, I, my grandma's got so much wisdom. We don't do that as much here. It's a problem. Um, we could easily, and we don't do this as a society, which means you got to do it on your own. We could easily value age differently and, and more. Where wrinkles, instead of them being a sign of, oh, she's getting old and is not as desirable as a human being and a woman, because that's the base of her attractiveness is youth and youth youth and you know this instead it's like oh with age comes wisdom and wrinkles and life experience and a wealth of stories and you could regard that as we could value that more makes sense to me um my experience in life is that for me in, in a lot of ways so many ways it's gotten better and it's gotten better because I've learned stuff because I've stopped making stupid mistakes um, because with life comes experiences and stories and things get richer um, I remember when people used to say oh college is the best time of your life college was great but then I was ready to move on and medical school is great. And residency was great. And, and, and every kind of every next step has also been, and I'm looking forward to the next thing, you know, to embrace that. Um, similarly, sure. If you feel good by getting attention and you're hot and showing some skin and whatever, like that's human. Um, but age is going to happen. It's ultimately a, um, foreshadowing our own death you know which is part of life too things change imagine if as a culture we valued age and we welcomed wrinkles as um as meaning something positive instead of trying to botox and run away with to them at every yes that kind of belief of mine is totally disconnected from the you know television 
beauty driven everything that we see. But that's what I think is really true. Kardashian is not, that's that reality. It's not, perfection is unattainable. I think women have a harder time feeling good about themselves because of the messaging constantly receiving from magazines, movies. I agree. I think I, I, I empathize with the challenge to being a woman in so many ways today, especially around image and beauty. And I have a daughter and I think about that stuff all the time with her and I worry about it. Going against all that is like swimming against the current. Yeah, but, but it's true. I figured this out recently. And I want to share this with you. The most important thing, this is pure integrity. That's all it is. Is figuring out what you believe. And I've said this before. I said this around politics and voting. It's figuring out what you believe and what's important to you and sticking to that despite anything. Despite the tribe believing otherwise or where you are. Or, and this is where it's even most challenging, your most, your closest family and friends, your partner, your husband, your wife, even, even believing what you believe and holding on to what's dear to you, even despite them thinking something else or there being consequences from it, this is what it means in psychology to, to remain, to be individualized, to remain distinct and be, truly be your own person. And much of that, I would argue, most of that even, is going to be swim feeling like you're swimming against the stream, that you're different, that you don't fit in with the herd in, in a lot of ways. Maybe in some ways, a lot of ways you do. But it's figuring out that stuff that is you, that you truly believe that is important. And here's what happens. You may feel sticking to your guns, for example... Let's say you believe more Democrat stuff and you live in a Republican part of town or the opposite. You may be a Republican living in a Democrat part of town. So you may experience from the local tribe being different and feeling different. But on the inside, you know that you're sticking to your guns and what you believe. And this feeling, staying connected to this, that is so much more important. The reason we're obsessed with conformity is because as animals, we grew up in a very tribal community where if we didn't agree with the tribe, they could kick us out and then we would die. And so we are genetically programmed to conform for our own survival. And it feels very uncomfortable to follow this. We're in a time now where that's no longer the case, where we have the luxury to be yourself in many cases safely, although you get a lot of examples of people being themselves, whether it was when gay people were coming out years ago. Some still an issue now in some places, but certainly a lot better than it was. All these kind of identity things where it's hard to, to be one's self. Something happened. Can't see this thing. Where it's hard to be oneself despite, you know, the local tribe. But at the end of the day, that kind of integrity where you act and speak and live in alignment, not off, not disconnected, not, you know, not aligned, in alignment with what you truly believe, who you are, that kind of stuff, that kind of integrity, that's it. That's happiness. Now, it's not without struggle, you know. That's that kind of life satisfaction and peace, inner peace with knowing that you are who you are and you're being all that stuff. Politics is just one example. Identity, sexual identity, or racial identity, if you're, say you're Muslim in a Christian world, for example. Uh, it's not easy by any means. But that's the only path to peace. And I would get comfortable with being different or disagreeing or even having people say shit and whatever to you. A better world is where, yeah, we would tolerate all of our differences. Welcome. And, and this is a better place, United States, than many in the world. But we're not there yet, right? Like, duh. In so many ways, duh. But that kind of integrity serves you in the long run so much better. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're, you're dating somebody and you have start having a conversation. Bring up something you disagree on. 
inside, part of you may be like, well, maybe I'll just agree with them to be agreeable and I don't want to whatever. And then in that moment, you are compromising on yourself. You're kind of betraying yourself a little bit. You're not being who you really are and what you really think. And in that moment, you're being phony with them. Maybe because you don't want to disappoint them or you want to whatever. And the way, how do we feel when we do that? You kind of feel shitty, right? Like your conscience is kind of like, oh, wow, we kind of sold ourselves out in that small little way. It doesn't mean on the first date you go into politics and religion and go at everything, but it, it means when you deem appropriate that you are true to who you really are. And it makes more sense to me to be that way from the beginning, not only with on a date with somebody you're, you love and whatever, but in everything, you know, there isn't a time to be phony. Maybe you deem it in your best interest to shut your mouth at work over politics because you might get in trouble for speaking a certain thing. That makes sense to me. But, but not to sell yourself out in that way. What do you think about all of that? I just went on a rant. I love that view. When I come to California, I'm going to... I'm going to gate crash you. I don't know what that means, but I might call the authorities. With age comes wisdom. I wish that I knew that at 30. I bet a lot of us wish that. I feel more beautiful today than when I did with I was younger, but I haven't changed much in looks. I've come to love my perfect imperfections. That's good. Yeah, that's right. Coming to feel that way as opposed to changing your exterior to try to be a mold, but actually feeling that way on the inside. It's not impossible to take so much energy to be yourself when you're constantly told it's not good enough. Well, then I would stop listening to those voices. Why are you listening to voices that are telling you that? Quit it. Cut them out. I'd eliminate them. If they're friends, you confront friends, family, whatever, confront them, say, I don't tolerate that. Goodbye. If it's media, whatever, stop looking at the media. Pick stuff that supports you, who you really are. Right? Like me telling you that, you know that's true. It's not easy, but you know it's true. And yes, it does take energy to be true to yourself. It's not easy. Totally agree. But the, the flip side of that is when you're not true to yourself, it's the worst. That's my encouragement. Easier to do with a support system, harder to do alone. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that, like, that's part of what the process of picking and surrounding yourself with good friends is. And a good partner is somebody that people that see who you are and appreciate that you for you, that's a true friend. And I, I, I don't know, it's more, I, it's more and more rare when you find that, hold on to that thing, right? Support system, very important. Jess Morinix, what's up? That's why I need to find the right tribe. Absolutely. Dove did a study on how women perceive themselves versus how other people perceive them. It was an interesting study on how we sham ourselves into thinking we're not good enough. I like that study. You should include that. As a Muslim woman in Christian world, I just had to say something to me yesterday and I survived. It scared me because it was more about what well, I survived, but it scared me because it was more about what this person will do. Will they hurt me? People are, there are insane people all over the place. I'm sorry that it's not, that it's harder to be non-Christian in this world, but that, but I still do, I want you to know, hey, you're not alone, you're welcome, we, I want you here. So many of us believe that the United States is a place of religious freedom where people should be able to come from all over the world, be, worship whoever they want, and be 100% safe. So that kind of harassment, if I were there, I would have taken care of that person easily been like, Hey, come here. No, no, you know, none of that. That's what we should do. Most people are afraid to swim against the tide because they don't want to be alone and they're too clingy to people. Introverts like me thrive as contrarians. It's extroverts who struggle. It's extroverts who struggle. I think both struggle. I don't know if I agree with you on that. 
L. E. Nirenberg in the house. Dana. Calico. 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 Hi, Dana. Next time, I hope someone like you is there. I think that's good, too. I'm sorry it happened, Nishant. I, want, I do want you to be safe. I want you to feel comfortable in your country standing up for yourself. We should do it, too, at the same time. Know that I am with you and that most people, most Americans, 90%, 95, 98 are totally comfortable with you being you, Muslim, a woman of color, whatever, 100% cool with that. And there are some stupid, you know, there's just some stupid dickheads out there that aren't. 50, the way that a lot of the Trump people voted does not mean that there's 70 million people out there that would do that to you. There are absolutely not. There are, this is a bad apple for sure that should be dealt with. I'll take care of them. Jess Chatton? I know who that is. That's my rant for today. You guys like that? How do we feel about that? There's so many things you can't control, but acting in alignment with what you really believe and who you are and what you and you such an integrity formula for peace and satisfaction in life what's a good one I don't know I, I sometimes I when, you're, when what you guys say comes up I forget what the hell I was ranting about you deserve to feel safe and secure absolutely and I and I want to talk about this don't feel alone don't let one fucker make you feel alone or like you're not part of this tribe because you are and you're not not just because I said so it's not dependent on me you know you are don't let that person control how you feel about being Muslim in America. We were founded on religious freedom. A bunch of Protestants left England and were like, screw the king. We don't want to deal with this shit anymore. We want our own thing. And I think if people, that is part of who we are as Americans. And... You ought to be able to do that here. Where's this rant coming from? What triggered it? What triggered what part of the rant? I, I think... Um, I think a lot of this division and racial stuff that is in the media is politicized in a way that we forget and... We forget who we really are and how most people in this country, both Republican and Democrat, really are good people that have a basic shared um, understanding of, of who we are. This is a great example. I think an overwhelming most people believe in letting people live their lives and determine their futures and however, how, live their lives however they want. Do your life your way in terms of worshiping who and what you want and you know buying your own your own supplements and using your crystals and oils and you get one life man i don't believe in reincarnation this is a place where you can live it however you want and that's an incredible thing in the history of the world i think most people most of us believe that despite you know, a liberal media message that is so charged to get people to vote a certain way. Don't get me wrong. There was bad stuff going on. 
maybe I'm a white guy that just doesn't care enough about the outcome. But, but I do think that we're go as a country, we're good. We need to get better, you know. I mean, there's a lot of things that still need to change, laws that need to be upgraded, and you know, we got to get better. Certainly, politics has a part to play, but. Uh, um, but I think most of us, black, white, Mexican, Chinese, whatever, that are here, really buy into this idea of um, it's a place for everybody. We're different, and and we can get along, and we can figure it out. I just think about so many of my practical encounters for example with black people black men in the last like month and a hundred percent of them they're nice guys <laughs> and we get along there's no tension I, I got into I was in a um, get into the plane with my daughter a while ago and we boarded late enough at Southwest where there were no more rows for us and a young black dude, I didn't have to say anything. He just like, hey, do you want my seat? I can go sit over there. I was like, oh, that was really nice. And I think that's how it is in a lot of times. Like, I was like, shit, that was a really nice thing from that guy. You know, like, makes me want to be in a place where we're helping everybody and acknowledge there's some racial stuff going on and I'm gonna do what I can to be nice and giving and, and, you know, and to get along like that. Not to be a dickhead that is threatening somebody because they're Muslim and look a little different. Hate crimes and bigotry are unacceptable in 2020. Oh, for sure. Don't Kill Granny started this one. Yeah. Grandmas are going to die in mid-December because people will have Thanksgiving dinners. And then a lot of them are going to die. I hope not yours. That's what I think about that. So, um, you know, the challenge, how can you, whoever you are, white, black, woman, man, Muslim, Christian, atheist, with the societal kind of culture that we have that is shared that is that there are good things about and there are crazy stupid unexplainable things about how can you um, find a sense of yourself that transcends that and stay connected to that thing that's your true north star your your compass and do right by that that's the key to inner peace, which is a little different than like happiness. I think a lot of us think happiness is like this cocaine high, I feel amazing. When really life is a series of I feel good, oh today kind of sucks, and it's, it's this, this is life. Somebody dies. Well, if you're this when somebody dies, you know, this is life. But that, that this is up here, that it's a more satisfied thing. And, and that is connecting to yourself. I'll give you another example. It's a good example. You guys will like this one. I think I kind of grew up in the Midwest um, with images of um, men being tough and stoic and not having feelings and so forth and being able to go out in the cold and not need a jacket and that kind of stuff. Now, in the last year or two, I've come to love sweaters. You've seen me wear sweaters because <laughs> they feel nice on my arm. They're soothing. They make me feel good. It's not very manly at all. It's more Mr. Rogersy. Mr. Rogers is an incredible wimp. Incredible. Like, I could kick his ass in a second for sure, right? But I've learned about myself that I like soft clothing that kind of soothes me. It makes me feel better. It gives me a somatic, they, they, psych, you know, academic psychologists would call it uh, 
regulating. It helps me regulate. It helps me feel a little better. I'm not very manly. So I've come to learn this about myself that is, you know, deep somewhere deep in the brain is like this societal family thing I grew up with. A man is stoic, tough, doesn't need a sweater to feel better, right? And then, like, here I am, 40-whatever I am, I don't know, man. I wear the sweater, and I'm like, I like the way that feels on my arms. It feels pretty good. Surprised myself a little bit there, feeling that, right? Despite what I was conditioned to probably not come to. And so it's kind of exciting. Mr. Rogers was incredible. There's no doubt he was incredible. He was not a physically strong specimen of man. He could get his ass kicked, but he was incredible. Is that part of what it means to be a man? Depends on the person. My point is, and I think this applies to you, in this way, getting to know the parts of you that are true about yourself, your likes, deeper stuff, who you are, especially when you discover these things and they're contrary to who you thought you might be, who you thought you were, just like the tough guy side of me that realized, gosh, I really like soft sweaters. What are some similar things? What are, what are your sweater things that you've recently learned about yourself that maybe go against who you thought you were or are surprises or discoveries in this way. That's, that's, that's fun. Like, and it goes back to the same integrity thing, which is being who you really are, figuring out and discovering. It's a process of discovery of who, who are you beyond what you have been conditioned to think that you are. And this is how we do it, is I find myself buying sweaters and wearing them and liking them. And then later I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't do this because it's not very manly. It's still not very manly, but I don't care. I like it. Yeah, it's fun. And I'm okay with that, you know? What a sweet story. Which one was a sweet story? I love Granny. Do you foresee another Cali lockdown? Absolutely. I wouldn't, I don't know if it's going to be a full lockdown. That will depend on how we respond. If Californians respond in various places and numbers go down, it won't be necessary. If people don't and they keep going up, they may very well be forced to lock down. I love your sweaters. So do I. Hey, Cali, Breegee, Hollywood, J-Rock, what's happening? Roger's sweaters, they were. You're changing the misguided definition of manly. Thank you for doing that. You're making the world a better place. Um, I'm, I'm expanding who I am in light of what I thought. I've learned in this Zoom world, I like lipstick. No, you don't like lipstick. Oh, the Southwest Airlines story was sweet. Well, it touched me in the middle of that racial stuff where I was just like, you know, it's like they're creating this white versus black narrative. It's like, if you're white and you vote for Trump, you're racist. If you're black, you have to vote for Biden because this is a racial thing. And I'm not saying there isn't a lot of racial stuff at play or that that isn't even a reason to vote that way. But what I am saying is that in front of my eyes, we get along pretty darn well, despite being different. And in more ways than not... I've been good to black people and they've been good to me. The media is telling a story that's different than my experience. Okay. I learned in this Zoom world, I like lipstick. What does that mean? And what are some other things that you like that maybe surprise you or aren't okay for you to like or something along those lines, you know what I mean? Like me liking a sweater and wanting to be a man, being a tough Midwestern man. Mire, 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 Mirea, 
Mireya. That's a lot of, a lot of Mireya Mireya, but welcome to you too. Brooks Hollander, what's happening? So, I see you guys there. I just checked on the list. I know who's here. Are there other things, I'm curious, are there other things about you that you've discovered, let's say like in the last year, that kind of surprised you about yourself? Maybe you thought you were a different way and you described that and, or you discovered it and you're like, oh wow, this is part of me. I like the sweater. Anybody? I just, I love that story. It's like the getting to know you thing, the true you. And then being that way. You know, so like the being that way thing would be like, if I'm on a date and she's like, why are you wearing that sweater? You're wuss. And then I'm like, no, because it feels good. And I kind of like that style. And then defending myself, the true me that actually does like that against somebody who potentially could be close, who doesn't accept that part of me. Well, that's their problem. Kind of hurts a little bit, but, but still stick to my guns. Good example. Uh, Tanya, I like talking to strangers, as in elderly people more. Sounds kind of creepy. No, I'm kidding. I like it. I like it. I like wearing lipstick. I like matching it to the color of my hijab. It makes me feel good. Nice. Now, is that something that a Muslim woman, that that's a little, that that's not okay, or that that's something you just recently started doing? Ex explain to me more the significance of that. And actually to everyone since COVID. Yeah, that's a good way to reach out. Uh, it's terrible. Why would you date that person? Well, I think that's how you learn about other people. That, like, it's a great thing because, it, like, that date thing, you be yourself and then you see, are they okay with that? Do they accept that? Do I have to be a certain way with them? That's a great way to evaluate somebody, right? Because you're not evaluating them on checkboxes or superficially. You're evaluating how you guys relate together. Super important. I'm being myself and being honest about something. How do they respond to that? Oh, that's a, I really like that. Traveling on a train and start up conversation. If I can make someone stay better with a smile conversation, I like that. That's great. I used to be all about fashion, but now in my 30s, I just don't care about how culture. I want comfortable, practical clothes. So I shop in the guy section because female fashion is impractical. <laughs> you find guy stuff to just be more simple and practical. Okay, interesting. And and you like and you like that. That works for you now. It sounds like a change. You love yourself more by doing things you enjoy and make you feel good. Love yourself more by doing things you enjoy and make you feel good. Sure, I would agree with that. Ashley, you gonna chime in? I see you there. Watching along. Um... Sounds like a dog fight. Do you guys hear that? All right, I should go. Thanks for chiming in, you guys. Nice to chat. Ah, finding as I teach on Zoom, I need something extra to feel better. Knock yourself out. Um... Thanks for chiming in. I think the message of today is to continue to uh, discover yourself, who you are, that true stuff, and stick to it, whatever it is, despite, despite the consequences, to hold on to it with courage and be yourself. Uh, and that, you know, in a shot, this is, is a place and should be more a place where everybody can feel safe to be who they are, including practice and worship how they want um be safe and smart over thanksgiving don't be stupid 
and don't kill your grandma with COVID, please. Pretty please. Uh, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Very good. Live talks help me feel better and connected. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. Thanks for chiming in. If there's anything else you guys want to talk about, send me a message. We'll get to it. Nice chatting. Enjoy your evenings. This one was fun. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. All that stuff. Do your part. Okay, bye.